Welcome to His House of Learning Podcast number 10. This is your host, Christian M.C. Fulmer. Israel's Blessings and Curses The central verse of concern, well, comes from Genesis, originally from Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, but it is mentioned throughout much of the Old Testament and a little bit of the New as well. Commonly you will hear, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And that is the Lord God's promise to Abraham, and thus the nation, the people of Israel by extension. And then there's an and along with this, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. More commonly you'll hear the first portion, not so much the second. And the reason why I bring this up is because, well, to be frankly honest, with the escalating tension and conflict that is now starting to connect with that of others around the world, so we have Israel with, well, realistically, Palestine. People would say Hamas, but really it's with Palestine. I mean, Israel and Palestine, which also involves... You know, uh, Hezbollah, portions of Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, the United States, and is now incorporating into the realistically into the fray Ukraine, Russia, and then as well as to a great degree China, Taiwan, and now you've even got others looking in as well, including Japan, Germany etc etc some far more involved than others u.s military is moving more naval power towards the mediterranean to what was to as known as the levant aka aka the shoreline along side sharing alongside israel and its northern neighbors and so i say my dear listeners I, I raise no alarm bells. It's just, when you look at the historical record, this escalation may very well lead to a much larger conflict, maybe regional, or, well, the, as people have made into a myth, World War Three. And I don't speak simply out of the sense of, oh, well, biblical prophecy dictates, well, bear in mind, there's that, and there's also reality of a world war was seen as, and was seen as a joke, a farce, something to not even consider before 1914. In fact, after World War One, aka the Great War, well, people figured mankind has had enough. That man had satiated its sin nature and no longer had any reason, and was. Now I've had enough experience, hard knocks, and enough wisdom to avoid a second global war. And now again, there's talks, there's 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 raising alarms, but there's also this still this hubris that we are beyond that. And so I say, uh, let's not kid ourselves here. Uh, but among the but among these uh, among these uh, rising conflicts, if not potential for global war, of which will take place and where and when exactly, will there be a defining moment such as uh, in Sarajevo, with the Archduke Ferdinand for the Great War, or the in, or te, or in, or the invasion of Manchuria for the Japanese between you know J- you know Japan and China and Asia and then. And then, of course, this, and of course, uh, the well-known invasion of Poland by the National Socialist Germany, followed up about less than a week later by the United Soviet Socialist Republic. Well, we don't know quite yet. I know what I know for a, for a fact is that the media, media or politicians, if not academia, will try to iron in. A starting date when it comes and get the war drums and get the conflict further spiraling because as many sides have argued 
Many sides argue, but also there's many that want to end end the fighting, end the bombings, end the assaults, end the espionage as soon as possible. But the, but the major players, the, the main those primarily involved, as far as they're concerned, it's it's either or. This is it, far, it seems to be for them at least total war until further notice. Now, why do I bring up the promise the Lord God made thousands of years ago to Abraham in regards to the future of his seed? Well, it seems to me that whether or not people are religious, secular in nature, in their thinking, there's still a tendency to go alongside of these biblical paradigms, whether they acknowledge it or not. In other words, does Israel have justification in what it says and what it wishes to accomplish? Does, do the American people and the government who support Israel in this conflict, is it well-placed, especially theologically? As well as for everybody else, are they fully justified in whatever measures that they take against the nation state as well? If not, if not Israeli and Jewish people at large around the world, because tensions are rising, it's true. Jews will call it anti Semitism. Well, I just call it internetic slash religious conflict because quite frankly, you can't support you can't support, you know, just you know, just blowing one side away and not face backlash. That's especially from people who are related to, related to and have alliances with those people. It's not exactly wishful thinking. Wishful thinking, if not quite arrogant. So let's let's take us back to the nature of the blessings and the curses, because it's something that doesn't just apply to the people, the ethnic the racial people of Israel and the Jews, but really it's for that of all of us, Jews and Gentiles alike. For as we have to remember something very important, the Lord God shows no partiality, and His chosen people aren't chosen because they're special. It's because, well, there was a covenant that they made with Him. And they and they've and they've broken it. There's covenants that we make with them, and we break them. And divine justice will be meted out to the chosen and not so chosen. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You'll see. Let's go to Rome. Let's go. To, sorry, Genesis chapter twelve, verses one through three. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So there's three things that we're going to look through as we go from passage to passage. Now, first off, notice that at the beginning, now the Lord God had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house. So that is the start of receiving the blessing, of entering this covenant. Is separating himself from, and where was Abram from? Look at the previous chapter, 11. He is of Ur of the Chaldees. The Chaldees, the same Chaldeans, who were uh, quite infatuated with mystery, with mystery, Eastern mystery religion of particularly of their own making, and so he's leaving his extended relatives. He's leaving his homeland to go to another place, and so the blessings. The covenant begins with a separation from your heathen origins. If not, 
to the point where it may be very necessary to physically re 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 you know, remove your, yourself. Verse 2, And I will make of thee great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So you'll be great, you'll be blessed, your name will be great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So you notice, that's the thing, nature of a covenant. The Lord blesses you, and you bless him, and the part of that blessing is fits in with what the great commandment: love the Lord God, thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And thou shalt be a blessing. We'll see later what is meant by the Lord's people being a blessing. In verse three, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So this restatement that you are going to be a blessing to these people, to everybody. But notice, at the beginning you have to what? And that's the thing, think about this. This tells you that the nature of being an Israelite or Jewish is not contingent on your ethnic racial origins. Because notice, where... Is Abraham from? Ur of Chaldees. The Israelis, Jews, Hebrews were not a completely distinctive, ethnically, racially separate people. Our, here's the thing you got to remember about the more original notions of ethnicity and race is it's all about family lineage. You know, your direct family line. So eventually, yes, they will become an ethnicity. They will become a race, especially because part of the ethnicity is building up, you know, common language, beliefs, customs, etc. But what do all those encapsulate? The will of the Lord God. And so he had to leave his peoples, his, his, his old people, his old families, beliefs, eventually, they would develop their own language, and establish customs that would be more according to the Lord, if not, <laughs> if not for a time, not for a time, if not time and time again, absorb heathen customs and beliefs, and constantly have to weed those out and separate themselves from them again and again and again. Moving on, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. And if you remember Deuteronomy, it is what? It's essentially a commentary of the law. A, grand, a grander history and explanation of the nature of the law and, what, and really what one should expect from the Lord and what the Lord expects. More importantly, what the Lord expects of them is a covenant it's not a contract. It's not sign your name here and you get whatever you want. It's no, it's it's a relation it's a it's a relation really of really what's all said and done of blood of blood and spirit. And the Lord does not break his promises. And remember this. Remember this. Did Abram have to accept it? When it's all said and done, we can argue predestination or whatever. But the key thing is this, in order to begin to put himself in position to enter into to the covenant, he had to do what first? He had to leave Ur of Chaldees. He had to leave Mesopotamia. He had to go to Canaan, a completely foreign land to him and his people, to his household. So keep that in mind. It wasn't just a simple matter of, oh, I've chosen you, yay. Like, no, it's, I've chosen you, so now you have to, what? Well, we're, we're going to see. We're going to see. Deuteronomy chapter 30, and then our main verse is 7. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee, 
which persecuted thee. So this is in remember this is after being delivered from Egypt. So once again, when you only look at one verse, and that's the thing, people have a tendency to interpret the blessings and cursings of Israel this way. Like, see, see, you know, see, you know, the God loves Israel, and they say in a way as if he doesn't love anybody else. Far from the truth. And he's going to basically bless them no matter what they do. Well, there's certain blessings that he will give them no matter what they do, but the main one being that they won't completely die out. So there will be an ethnic racial remnant. But as far as comfort and safety and security, no. That's not a guarantee, especially to those who don't. Who don't uh, who don't reciprocate their end of the covenant, which once again is a voluntary action, because as you can see, the Lord said, "Hey, if you hey, if you want this, you have to leave and follow my directions in this new land." And if you don't think Abr Abram had much going on for himself, where he already was, well, let me tell you something: it can't be that bad because going to a because during that time, and really think about it now, going anywhere going anywhere to a foreign place a foreign people a foreign everything these days is quite life-threatening and then <laughs> you might as well have been committing suicide but here's the thing you look at if you look at a ch chapter uh, look at chapter uh, sorry if you look at a uh, chapter 30 Starting in verse 1, and it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse. Oh, look at that. The blessings and the curse. So there can be curses meted out. Which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. So it's a warning. If you don't, if you, if you don't fulfill your end of the covenant, I will scatter you. You will have to leave this land that I that I promised you because well you broke the promise on your you know on your end and shall return unto the Lord thy God and shall but eventually they say eventually they'll be able to come back and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul so he's telling them it's like there will be a point where you'll disobey you'll be scattered but I will bring you back. So that's the one blessing that they'll get regardless of what they do, that they will eventually return. But as far as what happens in the meantime, well, yeah. That's up to each individual based on their, based on their faithfulness and the Lord's mercy. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath gathered thee, which is going to be primarily done by, through, through the uh, endeavors of first Assyria, and then shortly after Babylon. And if any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. And thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. Okay, so there's mercy shown upon them. They come back after the Babylonian cat you know, captivity. Bear in mind, only some of them, only some of them choose. Once again, only some of them choose to leave their heathen surroundings and go back to be the people of God and worship him. And the Lord and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thou mayest live, that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies. Notice. Put all those curses upon the thine enemies, and on them that hate thee, which persecute thee. And that's after what? Their hearts are circumcised 
to follow the Lord. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord, and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. And the Lord God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy land for good. The Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, and as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, if thou return unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. So, the covenant with Abraham was made. People assume that, oh, see, what? Well, see, the circumcision of the heart didn't happen until later. No, no. Because people go back to when the Lord made the covenant with Abraham. He said, okay, so this is the covenant. Just, you know, covenant. Sever your, the foreskin of your males and your males, especially, I think it was like eight days after they're, they're born. And that's the covenant. Except that that was the covenant. Why did he have to leave his heathen roots and start essentially and worship a different God exclusively, exclusively worship a different God and thus follow him and be separate, etc., etc. In fact, when you look at the life of Abraham, go to Genesis chapter 13, you'll notice that people are going to say, well, Abraham wasn't perfect. Or some people will say, well, you see, even though Abraham wasn't perfect, the Lord still blessed him. Okay, but once again, this is, you know, once again, so, so as Paul, who was a Pharisee at the time, you know, a killer of the followers of Christ, did he not say, did, did he not remind, you know, the church, did he not tell, to tell the Jews after the ascension of Christ that, that just because grace abounds, your, you know, what sins okay, it's not as big of a deal. No, so you should be looking to what the righteousness that the Lord has instructed you, has commanded of you, expects of you in this covenant. Because bear in mind, as we're going to read later, you may be forgiven of your sin, even as a believer. But the consequence, but justice, but you will not go unpunished on the side of heaven. You may, you will still receive a to a degree, as mercy may keep it from being worse than than, than it should be. Earthly punishment, you'll still enter heaven. That is, if you're truly re repentant, but you're still gonna have to face the consequences because the Lord is impartial. There's no get there's there's no get there's there's no get out of bad times card. You may be able to once again eternal damnation you'll you'll escape but but yeah don't expect anything don't 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 expect anything more than you know than that if you, if you've done evil in his you know in his sight in fact be be ever grateful thankful. That, that, that the full measure of the law is not, meted, is not meted out to you. Go to Genesis chapter 13. Starting, we'll start off with verse 14. And it says, And the Lord said unto Abram, After that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, Northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, And to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and the breadth of it, and I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent. Then notice, then Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. People will say the Lord didn't keep His promise. They, the Jews, the Jews, the Hebrews, the Jews, the Israelites did not reside in the land forever. Yes, because once again, it's a covenant. It's a covenant. Here, look what Abram. What, what does Abram at the time do? Worships the Lord. He dedicates 
the land to the will of the Lord, exclusively. In fact, in fact, war breaks out between the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and that of their neighbors. Their neighbors end up kidnapping Lot and a number of Abram's and Sarai's family and servants. So then Abram takes trained men, troops down, they launch a surprise attack, and they rescue. Sound familiar? But notice this. So they, but, 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 but upon rescuing their people, do they continue waging war? No, it's over. In fact, notice how they interact with their allies. This is a precedent that the Lord even, that the Lord brings up time and time again, especially to the kings of Israel and Judah, generations later, so many generations later. Go to chapter 14, verse 17 through, through like 24, it says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedor and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheve, which is the king's dale, and Melchizedek, so notice there's two kings, king of Sodom and, the, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, that interact with Abram, with Abram, and notice how he deals with both. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. So Abram, so Abram gives, gives a tithe. Why? To, the, to this holy, God-fearing king and priest. One of the very few exceptions in scripture. So that's the thing. So he's blessed by Mel Melchizedek, and Abram gifts him, gifts Melchizedek, this God fearing king and priest. Next. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto, unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldst say, I have made Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Anner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. So the only thing he takes from the king of Sodom is food, or is fighting men to eat. That's it. So he grants a gift, a tithe to Melchizedek, and refuses exorbitant gifts, aka bribes, from the king of Sodom, who is allied with the king of Gomorrah. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. And why do I and why do I emphasize this is the fact that the relationship between America and Israel is quite uh well questionable. We are both proponents of usury, which is uh, making wealth magically magically I say that strongly magically appear out of out of uh, out of the uh, gambling and the word I'm looking for, the speculation of interest, debt, which is debt, of you know, debt, fiat, and digital currency. We have no problem promoting sodomy. Israel is actually one of the most sodomy-friendly nations in, in the world. And likewise, we're not too shy. In fact, Israel is less shy about abortion. Keep that in mind. Usury, sodomy, abortion, amongst other 
idolatrous and abominable things that are shared between these two allies. So notice, here's the thing. So my point being is what? Israel does not have good relations with, with righteous governments, sovereigns, political, you know, civil sovereigns. And it receives money. In fact, Israel is the, receives the most foreign, particularly military aid from the United States for the last several decades and, and of course, has revamped it. Our, our supposedly devoutly, quote-unquote, Christian Southern Baptist uh, Speaker of the House, his first major order, his first major action as Speaker, as representatives of both the Democrat and Republican Party, and he received complete and utter bipartisan support, was to give further military aid to Israel in, in this conflict. And I say to me, and for me, that's a conflict of interest, no pun intended, because we have our own issues and quite frankly, why he didn't address any of them as the initial initiative is beyond me. Is beyond me, but. Well, that's because those who bless Israel will, will be blessed. Those who curse him will, will be cursed. Well, if you haven't been reading along with us and quite don't quite understand how there's a conflation here, there's misappropriation of the blessings and curses here, then I, frankly, you don't quite understand. In fact, let's go over to, let's go over to uh, chapter 17, Genesis. Verse 1, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And I will be their God. Except what happens when the Lord is not their God. Syria, taking Judah, and then Babylon taking Israel. I'm sorry, I was with the other way around. Yes, yeah, Syria taking Israel and Babylon taking Judah. And then only a small fraction choose to return after the captivity is over. And not much more come back, even during the Pax Romana. In fact, many of them are infatuated with the Greco Roman Eastern esoteric world. That has, be, that has become an imperial powerhouse of, of worldly wealth and wisdom. Once again, look into the early history of Zionism, of establishing the current nation state of Israel, and you will find an abundance of desire for worldly wisdom and wealth much more so than a desire to worship the Lord God once again in the land that he had promised. And once again, he will give it to them. They will eventually get it, all of it, but only when, only when they finally, as a whole, under the sovereignty, the divine perfect rule of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will that occur. So what's happening in the meantime with the current state of Israel? Well, can't say for sure. It doesn't quite fit the covenant, I'll tell you that much. 
but it is leading up to its fulfillment. Because after all, you'll read the book of Hebrews. The Lord makes it clear that he wants to, he wants to fulfill his promise that he made to the faithful, to, to, to the repentant patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At least fulfill the coming he made with, with them. But in the meantime, for the rest of us, well, that's a thing. The Lord's impartial. The Lord's impartial. After all, we have our own covenants with him. To be whether or not to be his people or not. Whether or not to be followers of his of his resurrected son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He will he'll be he knows who's who amongst us too. Keep that in mind. Whether you claim to be a Jew or a Gentile. Whether you become whether you become a follower of Yahweh or a follower of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, he knows the difference. He's no fool. There's no tricking him. There's no tricking him. Oy. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 30. This is before Babylon captures what, captures what remains and scatters them. Well, not all of them. Just the best of the, the best and brightest. So then he can sub, so then the, they can sub, subdue the rest, and hence the mixture amongst the people, and leading to the leading to the uh, arrival of the arrival the the origins of the Samaritans. But anyways, chapter Jeremiah chapter thirty. Once again, our central verse is twenty. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. This is Isaiah. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 20. Now we're actually here. Their children also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. Once again, we read it that way. Oh, look at that. Look, see? Punishment to those who don't, who, who don't support, who don't help, who don't, who don't bless, you know, Israel the way that the Israelites want to be blessed. Keep that in mind. There's a difference between the way, the way they want to be blessed and how the Lord wants us to bless them. Remember, this is Jeremiah. So he's prophesying of the regathering of Israel. And so once again, that regathering is what? Of the faithful. The regathering of the faithful will turn them to the promised land. With Who have what? If you read the book of Nehemiah, they have the intention of reestablishing proper, devout worship. Circumcision of the heart of the Lord God. A.K.A. not engaging in the wickedness and abomination of the world. So Jeremiah chapter 30, verse starting with verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob. So he's referring to, which is Israel at large. Saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel. For lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be in quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, say the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. So, the long-term promise is, other nations will rise, other peoples will rise and fall, they will disappear, go extinct. But the people of Jacob, Israel, will never, will never go away, will never fade you know, you'll, you'll never fade away. But I will correct thee. But notice, so you'll never go extinct. But, continuing in verse 11, I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. For thus saith the Lord, thy bruises is incurable and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. So, Whatever you do, whatever you do that's evil, whatever you do that is against me, 
Don't expect that you're just gonna. It's, there's gonna be no consequence. There's gonna be no burden. There's gonna be no hardship. There's gonna be not. There's gonna be no boomerang effect here. <laughs> just you're just. And if I don't heal you from whatever you inflict on yourself, well, deal with it. All thy lovers, so those who prostitutes who have forgotten thee, thy, they seek thee not. For I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. So they just rebel more, they just engaged in more evil. Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquity. Oh, I'm sorry. Because thy sins were increased, I have done these things unto thee. So look at that, repeats again, makes it very clear. When the Lord repeats himself, it's because we're not listening. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't ignore me. I have done these things unto thee. Therefore, all they that devour thee shall be devoured. And all thine adversaries, every one of them shall go into captivity. And they that spoil thee shall be a spoil. And all that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds. I will not Remember, not in the not in the moment, but I will. Why? So then you don't completely die off. You don't go extinct. You, you are not eradicated from from the earth. You, you will continue as a bloodline of sorts, <laughs> because they called thee an outcast, saying, "This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after." Thus saith the Lord. Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents, and have mercy on his dwelling places. And the city shall be builded upon her own heap, and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. And out of them sh shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of them that make merry. And I will multiply them, and they shall not be few. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Their children also shall be as aforetime. And their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. Verse 21 and 22. And their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governor shall proceed from the midst of them, and I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach unto me. For who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord? And ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. That's the thing. It's a covenant. And notice here. If they sin against the Lord and they continue unrepentant, well, they'll reap what they sow. And if they break the covenant, they're not going to get the blessings of the covenant. So they're going to get the blessings of their fellow heathen nations. And the same will be can be said for those who are spiritually grafted into Israel, disciples of Jesus Christ, the adopted sons and daughters of, of, of the Lord God. The Lord knows who his people are, those who are circumcised in heart. Uh, there's, there's no like, well, I am this or I am that. So thereby, I, the, Lord, the Lord blesses me and curses my enemies. Eh, depends on what you're talking about. But, don't get ahead of yourself. There's no hubris. Don't. <laughs> There's your hubris means nothing to to him. So, in conclusion, my my dear listeners, in the matter of supporting or not supporting Israel, the bigger question is: Are you in covenant with the Lord God? Because, well, Israel, the Jews at large, will survive. But that doesn't mean that they're gonna mean that they're gonna be get off for any evil that they do on the side of heaven, not by a long shot. But the matter is about your eternal soul. So I say, my dear listener, my fellow brethren, Lord Savior Jesus Christ, whether it be Jew or Gentile, are we truly in the covenant? Or are we well engaging in Talmudic Kabbalistic schemes? Bow down 
and worship him. This is Christian MC Fulmer, signing out.